So I turn it on and there you have it. So what is this? What is this? Guys, this was a revolutionary technology. The fact that I can create that line of light inside of that tube is amazing. And now, before you say that this is very boring, just wait for me to explain because this gets very, very interesting. Okay, so you might not know what this is, but how about this long tube that we have inside here? As you can see, it's from Toshiba. No? Doesn't ring a bell? Oh, and look what it says there. X-ray warning. Ooh, scary. Okay, so you still don't know what this is. Not in that format, not in this format. How about in this format? Depending on your age, you might know that this is a very old black and white TV. And to be more specific, a cathode ray tube TV. So yeah, this is a cathode ray tube. But how do we pass from this to a TV? And more important, what is a cathode ray tube? But first, some history. This technology started around the year 1890. That's right, 134 years ago. Mind blown. Anyway, around that time, Julius Placker and Jonathan Wilhelm discovered that some rays, some mysterious rays, were emitted from a cathode, and the cathode being the negative electrode of any electrical circuit. For example, these two wires. This one, since it's connected to the negative side of the battery, will be the cathode. And this one, since it's the positive, will be the anode. Now, obviously, you need a little bit more than just some simple wires to be called a cathode, but we'll see that in just a moment. Before talking more about these mysterious rays, we need to pay the bills, so let me show a message from the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. My new project was requiring some flexible PCBs, and PCBWay was the right solution for that. And the order process is so simple, just go to PCBWay.com and select flexible PCBs. Upload your Gerber files as always, and select your settings directly on their website. You also have the option for rigid flex PCBs if you want, and other settings for the color, the thickness, the gold immersion, and so on. I received my PCBs in just a couple of days, and they look amazing. The tracks are very small, but even so, PCBWay did a great job, and they have capabilities that go even lower than that, and you could check them on their website. So try yourself their services for flexible PCBs like mine, and like that you can complete your awesome project. And check more for other services for prototyping PCBs, automatic assembly, SMD stencil and much more on PCBWay.com. Ok, now we can continue. They've also discovered that these mysterious rays were traveling in a straight line from the cathode to the anode. And how did they knew that? Well, they were placing some objects in between the anode and the cathode. And then behind the anode we have some sort of screen with a fluorescent paint. And then a shadow with the shape of that object was casted onto that screen behind the anode. Meaning that these lines were flowing in a straight line from the cathode to the anode. To make you understand that experiment, here I have a piece of paper that is fluorescent. And this is a UV light lantern. And as you can see, if I put the light on top of the paper, it glows. Leaving some light behind. So basically this will be the cathode emitting those mysterious uh, rays. And if I place an object in between, I cast a shadow with the same shape as the object onto that screen, meaning that the light is going in a straight line. So obviously in that same way, those mysterious rays were also going in a straight line, just by placing an object in between and watching the casted shadow. Okay, so by now we know that if I apply some voltage to some electrodes, from the negative side to the positive side, some mysterious rays will be flowing. But there's something I didn't mention. This process wouldn't be possible like in mid-air, because you see the air is full of stuff. You have dust, you have molecules of oxygen, maybe CO2, other gases, and so on. So in mid-air, this process wouldn't be possible. We need vacuum. And there is one more thing I didn't mention. The voltage that they've used wasn't a voltage from a battery of 12 volts. We need high voltage. Okay, so now we know that to create those rays, we need vacuum and also high voltage. That's why this glass tube is filled with vacuum, actually it's empty with vacuum, because they sucked out from this hole with a vacuum pump all the air. So we have vacuum inside and also I'm applying high voltage with this, and as you can see, I get that line. So why do I have that line? Well, because this metal here inside is covered with some paint that is reacting to those rays, and that's very important, we'll see later. And with that we can create light, so when the rays are passing and touching the metal bar, they create that line here. By the way, that piece of metal is placed at an angle inside of the tube. So the rays are coming from here. They are touching the metal plate. They generate light in the form of green light. 
and then they come here to the adult. To find out what these rays were, in 1891, Arthur Schuster demonstrated that also an electrical field could bend the trajectory of those rays. Basically, if you apply an electrical field perpendicular to your rays, you can deflect the trajectory upwards or downwards. So as you can see, inside of my tube, I have the anode and the cathode, but I also have these two electrical plates that barely touch, creating some sort of like capacitor. So if I apply a voltage to these plates, it will create an electrical field that is perpendicular to my rays. So just by changing the voltage to those plates, I'm changing the electrical field so I can move the rays upwards and downwards. Let me show it to you. I'm starting my rays, I'm starting my voltage, and as you can see, I've moved the potentiometer and the line go upwards and downwards because I'm changing the voltage. Now I'm applying like 200 volts to those plates and as you can see, I can move them. And that's very important to know that an electrical field could deflect those rays because this will tell us a lot about what kind of rays we are looking at. As you can see, by rotating the potentiometer, the line goes upwards or downwards because I'm changing the electrical field between those metal plates and those will deflect the trajectory of our rays. And this is a very important piece of information in order to know what kind of rays we are looking at. But there is more. William Crookes also demonstrated that not only the electrical field could change the trajectory of our rays, but also magnetical fields. So here I have a magnet, so if I were to place this close to my rays, it should affect the trajectory upwards or downwards. Let me show you. I have my rays, and now I get close, and as you can see, it bends the rays upwards. But look, if I flip the magnet, it bends the rays downwards. So we have polarity. That's also another very important piece of information. Pretty cool, right? Upwards, downwards. Upwards and downwards. Nice, right? Okay, so let's just make a summary of what do we know. We know that these mysterious rays are flowing in a straight line because they cast shadows of the objects that you put in front of them. We also know that the electrical field and magnetical field could bend the trajectory of those rays. And not just that, they have polarity and we know that the positive side attracts the fields and the negative will deflect them. So that tells us that these rays have negative charge and that's also very important. But one more thing, they've also done some tests with a fan inside and when the rays are flowing, this fan start moving. And that means that these rays have mass. And that's a very, very important piece of information. Because the only rays that could have mass, subatomic size, they flow in a straight line and also have negative charge, are the electrons. So yes, this was basically an electron gun. Electrons are flowing from the cathode to the anode. These electrons are hitting the paint which is fluorescent and create light. So why is this so important? Why was this such a revolutionary technology? Okay, so we finally know what those mysterious rays were. Are just electrons flowing from the cathode to the anode. But have you wondered why we have a straight line and not just a full flow of electrons all around? Well, if you take a closer look inside of the tube, as you can see we have a metal plate with a slit. So the entire electron flow is blocked, but not the electrons that are passing through the slit. That's why we get a line and also the plate has an angle, so that line of electrons is touching the entire plate, creating our line of light. That's why we have an entire line, and not just a full-sized flow of electrons. And remember that this metal plate has a paint on it, which is fluorescent, and that means it will create line when it's hit by the electrons. And that's very important as well. Okay, so now we have our electrons. We have our electron gun. So now we pass to the other side in order to create a TV. We needed that fluorescent paint. Actually, depending on the used paint, actually the used material, the color of that fluorescence would be different. Actually, the first screens that were created were green, as it is my oscilloscope. But then, as you can see, for the first black and white screens for TV, were black and white. So that fluorescence color was now white. So let me just show you a process in order for you to understand how we pass from the electron gun to a TV creating shapes or pictures. Okay, so here I have this piece of paper, as I've shown you before, and this has a fluorescent material on top of it. And then I have three lasers, one red one, a green one, and a blue one. If I shine the red one, as you can see, nothing happens. And if I shine the green one, the same, nothing happens. So this material is not fluorescent to this kind of wavelength. But if I use the blue one, as you can see, I can draw shapes. This is so cool. So it gets fluorescent, which means that it will emit light 
without any external energy because the energy is already given by the light. So as you can see, we can draw shapes. So imagine now that you have an electro gun that's pointing electrons to this material and then you move it very, very fast, creating shapes and drawing pictures. That's how basically a TV works. But obviously, there's a lot more to it, so let me just explain. Actually, let me just show you another example with the lights off because this is very cool. Let me just see if I can write. The electronodes. This is so cool, right? Imagine making like a watch, like a clock with this. I just write the time, one, two, zero, eight. It would be cool, right? But as you can see, this is a fluorescent material. So I can draw shapes. Obviously for a TV, the delay would be a lot faster because you don't want to have this shadow of the light. Okay, so now we know the theory, but now how do we pass from this simple tube to a TV? Well, we need four steps. And the first step is to just remove the slit and instead of a slit just add a very small pinhole. In that way just a small amount of electrons will pass, creating just a simple dot which will be our pixel. The second step is to remove this metal plate inside and place it here, flat. Actually you want to make the glass tube flat which will be our screen, cover it in that fluorescent material and now that very small dot of light will reflect here creating our first pixel because it will glow. And now we have our pixel. The third step is to control the brightness of that pixel because if you want to create shadows from black to white, you need to change the intensity. And that's very easy. Just by changing the voltage applied to the anode and the cathode, you can change the intensity of the electron, basically in the intensity of the glowing effect. So just by increasing the voltage, you will get to white and decreasing the voltage, you will get to black. And you can create different tone for drawing your picture. And then we go to the fourth step, which is now that you have your pixel on your screen, you have to move it, creating your entire image. So as we have seen, you can move your pixel just by creating an electrical field or a magnetic field. So imagine that instead of just these two plates, you have four plates, one for the vertical axis and another one for the horizontal axis. In that way, you can move the pixel all around. Basically, that's what inside of this TV. So let me just open it up and show you because in that way you will understand a lot better. Okay, so I have my TV open, let's start the dissection. We don't care about this because this is for processing the signal, the radio signal. We do care about this. This is the flypack transformer creating the high voltage that we need for the electron gun, which the positive is connected to the anode, which is basically this is the entire tube. As you can see, this is the same as that. This will be the cathode and the anode will be on the other side. And as you can see, this is made of glass. The only difference is that the tube is flat on this side and it's open to create the screen. But it's basically the same. We have the positive on this side and the negative right here. And this is the electron gun. This is where the electrons are created using high voltage. And those will go and hit the screen and create our dot. And then we have these two electromagnets here. Let me just make a zoom. Okay, so this is the electron gun. The electrons are shooting towards the screen. And then you have this coil here which is with these white uh, bands. And then you have this coil here, basically creating some electromagnets, creating magnetic fields. And remember, with the magnetic field, you can deflect the dot. This is for the horizontal and this is for the vertical. And these are the input pins. And right now, as you can see, I've disconnected the wires for those, from those pins. So now if I turn on the screen, since we don't have anything connected to the electromagnets, to the coils, we should get just one dot. So let me just show you that. Remember, the deflection coils are not connected, so the pixel is not moving, so we should get just one dot in the middle. Let me just turn it on. Takes a little while. And there you have it, just one dot. Actually, let me just touch the coils, see if I can move it. No, I can move it because we need a bit higher voltage for that. But now I'll connect it to my oscilloscope and apply a sinusoidal wave, and you will see that the dot will start moving. Actually, without even using the coils, I have the magnet, which also creates magnetic fields. As you can see, I can move the dot. This direction, and this, and this. As you can see, if I move it around, if I move it around, I can move the pixel. So imagine doing this very fast, drawing your shapes. I've connected back only the horizontal line. So now instead of a dot, we should get a straight line. Let's just see that. 
So yeah, now we have a line. So now what I will do is to connect to the vertical axis my oscilloscope and apply a sinusoidal wave and you will see that the line will start bouncing around because I'm moving it on the vertical line. Okay, so I have my function generated connected back on the coil and now if I start it with the sinusoidal wave, as you can see, the line is moving up and down and I can change the frequency. Let me just make it faster. There you have it, 1.5 hertz, 2 hertz, faster and faster. So there you have it, it moves. Let me just try maybe a different kind of pulse square wave. Exactly, for a square wave, it will go up and down very fast. Maybe a ramp. The visual one is the sine wave, where it goes up and down. Let me just place it to 0 0.5, so half a hertz. And there you have it. So here it is, the input from my function generator, connected there to the vertical coil. And as you can see, it moves up and down. So basically, we are controlling three things here horizontal, vertical, and also the intensity. Now this tube is a bit different because it also has a heating lamp generating more electrons. That's a bit different, but basically it's kind of the same as this cathode ray tube here. So now you know it. So guys, now you should know what is a electron gun, what is the cathode ray tube, and how it evolved, and how you pass that to create a TV. Now, obviously, I didn't mention all the steps. I didn't mention how the heating lamp inside of the TV works and how you get the AM signal or the radio signal and then pass that to pictures. I'll place a picture on the screen from the video of the radio camera because there we can see the signal, the, the AM signal. I think this is an AM signal. Then, then you pass that to your picture. You make the entire pixels on your screen, creating the pictures, and then you do that 25 times each second, so we need a lot of speed. Also, I didn't mention anything about the color TV because it works the same, but you have a grid separating the electron gun for red, green, and blue. And then the material that you have on the screen is fluorescent in the red, green, and blue lights. And then you can create a pixel. And depending on the amount of power that you put into each pixel, you can create, create different colors. Anyway, that will be for a second video. So guys, I hope that you like this kind of content and that you have learned something new. And if so, consider giving me a like or comment below, or maybe even support my work on Patreon. My channel is passing through some rough time this year. Anyway, I will really appreciate your support. Thanks again, and see you later, guys. Hey guys, so as you all know, making these kind of videos is not that easy for me. It requires a lot of time, a lot of machinery, and also oscilloscopes, power supplies, and so on, and also a lot of modules. And thanks to your support on Patreon, is it a lot easier for me to buy those modules. So thank you very much to all my patrons and also to you guys for commenting below, for giving likes to my videos and also sharing my videos to help spread out this information. So thank you very much.